Welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I'm your host, Kevin Aline, covering for Darren Jaime. We thank you for joining us. If you are asking the question, what is this show about? We bring you a forum discussion providing a deeper understanding of the issues and inequities many communities face. From systemic inequalities to pressing social problems, our guests will provide multiple perspectives and insights to help us better understand and address these challenges. We invite you to stay connected with us as the Social Justice Forum starts now. Welcome back. New York City Mayor Eric Adams announced the city has achieved a record high employment rate, recovering jobs lost due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, Mayor Adams and his administration dedicated resources to initiatives benefiting small businesses. Notably, the Small Business Resource Network has successfully assisted over 40,000 small businesses, enabling the launch of many new ventures. Joining us now is SBRN Restaurant Resource Specialist at the Bronx Chamber of Commerce, Miguel Matos. Miguel, thank you so much for joining me. Hello, happy to be here. Now, can you tell me about the Bronx Chamber of Commerce and how it's connected to SBRN? The Small Business Resource Network is a program which is bought by the uh, mayor's administration. However, it is housed and hosted at each individual chamber of commerce. So we always have a borough to focus on and work with individually. Now, uh, we got to talk about it a little bit beforehand and I thought it was like really interesting. Uh, so you are a, res a restaurant resource specialist. Can you tell me a little bit more about that title and what you do? So the restaurant industry has been very important to the city of New York, is resiliency and how it impacts the culture. So food has always been a very, uh, a, a segment of our economy that brings people together and makes people happy uh, as they're going through hard times. So during the pandemic, we saw a lot of restaurants closing, struggling to stay open, struggling to get access to their resources during a time where most of the city was locked down. As a result, they developed restaurants resource specialists, which are dedicated members across the city, able to go into the restaurants themselves and address the needs and concerns of those business owners. And I also want to highlight um, that it's you know particular to the Bronx. Now, I know that every, every borough has one, but can you talk about you know the need to have one specialized, especially for the Bronx? Absolutely. The Bronx makes great food. Um, and we are one of the most vibrant boroughs out there on the edge of cultural influence. So going into these small restaurants, really highlighting their uh, successful attributes, great attributes that they bring into communities and how they keep communities alive. Uh, we saw that as a need and decided to dedicate one person per borough to go in and do that. Um, day to day, I try to focus on restaurants that really need the help. Uh, really want the help and are able to um, cut. Well, I, I kind of want to expand on that a little bit just for the, the organization as a whole. Mm. Uh, I know that your organization has reached over 40,000 small businesses. Can you just talk about the different types of businesses? I know you work with restaurants, but you know, what are some other businesses that benefit you know, from being associated with SBRN? So we provide services to a wide range of businesses, anything from daycare centers, cleaning, cleaning businesses, laundry mats, retail businesses, and restaurants, of course. Uh, with everything from marketing to general business coaching, compliance, and other regulatory uh, insight, we help offer them technical assistance in any one of those areas. Now, you know, I thought this was really interesting because a lot of people have ideas for uh, you know owning a business and we see so many people have high hopes for these businesses but unfortunately they don't always you know they're not always successful or sometimes they're very short-lived you know can you just talk about the importance of you know your organization kind of being there to provide you know some of these services and you know you mentioned some of the things that you guys do why was that so important right because day-to-day -day business can be very uh, a huge undertaking growing your small business. We found that many business owners were stuck in day-to-day -day operations, making their business grow, and therefore they weren't able to take advantage of the various resources. Um, so I love that I'm able to come in and help these guys on a one-to-one -one level every time with their needs. 
Now, the Small Business Resource Network has played a crucial role in supporting services offered by SBRN that have contributed to job growth in the city. Can you just talk a little bit, you know, a little bit more about that? You know, just because as mentioned, you know, COVID, you know, with COVID, so many people have lost their job and, you know, their, their means of living. So can you just talk about how your organization has assisted with, you know, seeing the growth of that? Absolutely. 90, over 90% 90 of the economic jobs created in New York City have come directly from small businesses. So we go in there and help them overcome any challenges that they may be having um, and making sure that they're able to work another day. Now, what is the important or what is the important services that are offered to business owners? So you talked a little bit about like how you help help these um, businesses, but what are some of the services that they can possibly like look for um, and maybe grow in certain areas? So they can come to us for a wider range of services, ranging from general business coaching to legal help, as well as technology assistance. Maybe they want to start and implement a new platform, such as getting on Grubhub, getting on Uber. A lot of people or business owners, small business owners, uh, have technical challenges, sometimes literacy challenges. Uh, there might not be a manual written in every language for them to take advantage of. So we come in there and provide those one-on-one -on -one services. Um, also, along with marketing assistance, we may pair them with a great marketing resource, maybe a school or an advertising program, such as BronxNet, that we can advise them to, hey, take advantage of these free resources in your local community and that will help you grow. So anything that may be outside our experience or scope, we have a resource for them to lead to. Now, you also mentioned something earlier and just now that I thought was so important, and you talked about language, how like, you know, um, like you mentioned like before, you know, off camera, like in Staten Island, that there's not a lot of people there that speak Spanish, and so that's where you come in um, to kind of help with that. Can you just talk about the importance of like having people from different backgrounds to help a lot of people who are running these businesses? Because as you know, here in the Bronx, we have so many different cultures and so many different backgrounds. So, you know, m first, what are some challenges that can happen uh, when you you know come from a background where there may be language barriers mm -hmm. and you know what are some things your organization does to kind of help with that right so because we are a team under SBRN spread out across the boroughs we do do cross borough engagements and as you mentioned there is one trip which we have coming up which is to Staten Island Staten Island happens to be just a smaller populated borough and as as a result, their chamber has a small staff. Um, some of the problems that they have over there is that they don't have a Spanish-speaking person within the chamber. But being a part of the Small Business Resource Network, we schedule a day where we're gonna go out there ourselves, either myself or Dari or another Spanish speaker, and we'll be doing walkthroughs with their small business specialists, making sure that all the resources that are available to that community are effectively communicated and made available for them. Now, I think that's like a really amazing example of how the five Chamber of Commerce work together to kind of help the businesses. You know, what is that experience like for you? I know for a, a lot of people, like going to another borough uh, almost feels like going to like another country sometimes because, you know, we're just so used to like being in our bubbles. So, you know, what is it like to kind of communicate with some of the other boroughs and uh, kind of work together with other people to kind of make sure that people who run small businesses are kind of on the path to greatness? So I love working across boroughs. Uh, before I always stayed in the Bronx, most of my days are in the Bronx, but when you go out to the other boroughs, you find out how similar we really are. Some of the business corridors in the Bronx are exactly the same as some of the business corridors out in Queens and therefore face many of the same challenges. Uh, I'm glad that we are able to go out there and exchange solutions that we each find in each one of our neighborhoods and we're able to bring those to our own. Now, the Five Borough Chamber Alliance leaders express their delight at New York City reaching an all-time high in total jobs. Can you tell us more about the significance of this achievement for the city's economy and its residents? Uh, absolutely. If this is such an achievement for, for the city because it really shows the resilience of the city and how many more years we have of growth ahead of us. Now, can you talk a little bit, you know, for those, even though uh, 
it was a it was a very crazy time, you know. Can you just talk about what it was like or maybe what you have seen in the time during the pandemic that kind of makes this uh, achievement so great? Like, what was the experience like, um, you know, when people were possibly, like, losing jobs? Like, how did that affect so many people in the community? Um, I believe that the closing of businesses during COVID was a really scary time for residents and businesses. Seeing us come out there and help them uh, gave a sense of hope to them that they would be around for the next year or two and also that the city was going to be there for them to assist them through this challenging times. And as for somebody who works specifically uh, with restaurants, I know that a lot of us got to see kind of because we go to restaurants more often, we kind of got to see like how they transformed throughout the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, from when the doors were closed to when they, you know, did outdoor dining. And, you know, unfortunately, some restaurants just, uh, you know, just closed completely because it was a lot to kind of uh, the challenges were just too great. Uh, you know, what was your experience through that or working with possibly some of those restaurants or if you didn't work with those restaurants during that time, you know, what, what is it like working with them now mm -hmm. after, you know, the pandemic? I came on after, right after the pandemic into the SBR program, mm -hmm. but just being a person going out day to day, you really were able to see how the pandemic was affecting businesses. Restaurants at first were completely closed, then they moved on to solely takeout, and then you saw the progression of 20% capacity up to 50% capacity, 80, and now we're at 100. So the restaurant was the perfect environment for you to see how we were coming out of the pandemic and a pathway to recovery. Um, so I always saw things from that approach during the pandemic. Um, now I love to see restaurants filled and packed because it really shows where we are and how, come we, how far we've come out of the pandemic. And, and I agree 100%. I think for a lot of people, like, even if you're not somebody who, like, follows everything, because, like, in the city, like, our city is so vibrant. We like to go out and we like to socialize. We got to see kind of that transformation with restaurants, even if we don't work in the business. So mm -hmm. I agree 100%. Um, now, can you just provide some insights to the key challenges faced by small businesses in New York City? So, you know, what are some challenges that small business owners face? Um, and this could be prior to the pandemic or, you know, some challenges that they continue to face even now after the pandemic? I think right now one of the biggest challenges that is being faced across the city by residents and small business is the cost of rent. It's the number one complaint from many small businesses um, and it is probably the hardest to deal with because many of these businesses are locked into long-term leases. If they are locked into short-term leases then they can see their rent fluctuate greatly every two years. So it's a bit of a balancing act of how you're going to um, dedicate yourself to a space, put capital improvements into a space, um, because this could be your biggest cost, uh, your make or break kind of expense. So I would say number one is rent is the, the number one attribute that's uh, affecting many people in the small business world. And I'm curious, and if you don't know, that's, you know, that's okay, yeah. but I noticed that like, um, like, you know, maybe in some neighborhoods of the Bronx, we're seeing new, like, major, like, big businesses uh, that are coming into some of the smaller neighborhoods that are um, maybe taking over. You know, is it hard for smaller businesses to compete with, like, the large chain that's coming into their, um, their neighborhood? Have you noticed any challenges with that? Um, I think that small businesses know what they offer. They know they offer that boutique style experience, that wholesome connection to their residents and their customers and communities. So I always feel that small businesses at the end will always have a competitive edge over larger big box stores because of that personal touch they're able to offer. And now can you just talk about, you know, how your organization addresses those challenges to facilitate growth? So we help facilitate growth and help them come overcome those challenges, such as high rent, by connecting them with resources that can help. Uh, just having a finance background, my thing is access to capital. I love making sure that these guys are always aware of where they can get funding from, how to put together a sound plan that will allow them to either repay funding or get better funding in the, in the in the forms of grants, right? The best money is free money. So I make sure that they are, they 
always have access to those, are knowledgeable about those, um, and then they can apply those resources as they see fit. If, if it's rent, well, maybe you, know, you feel that's a lighter load on your shoulders. Now, are there any eligibility requirements to receive help from the SBRN? Um, and if somebody wants to receive help, how should they go about that? So every small business is eligible to receive help from the Small Business Resource Network. It doesn't matter if you are an at-home business, a brick-and-mortar business, or just an online business. Just reach out to us via one of our various channels, whether it be smallbiz.net or on Instagram at thenewbxcc.com. Now, what I think is so amazing is that the organization initially launched as Pandemic Recovery, um, but for many people, you know, we're out of the pandemic um, and, you know, like we're kind of getting used to like what life was like previously, you know, before the pandemic. Uh, how has the organization evolved in the way that it's helped people, you know, maybe from like 2021, 2022, and now in 2023? So we have evolved by offering them different types of services before it was kind of like survival stage services, legal services um, primarily, uh, as well as grant and funding access, access to capital type of services. Now in 2023, people are more willing to take on other services such as marketing help, business coaching, uh, so that they can take their business to the next level. I see that many businesses are, I'm glad to see, they're no longer in that survival mode. Uh, they're more in the growth stage. Um, so those resources have become increasingly in demand. Now, as you mentioned, like they're no longer in survival mode. Do you know, do you have any success stories that, you know, you were able to see a restaurant go from, you know, maybe they were struggling or not a restaurant, just any business, maybe they were struggling um, and now you see them thriving um, and doing well in their communities? Absolutely. Uh, restaurants such as Focus Lounge, which is on Fordham Road, we held a few events there while we were in the early stages of the recovery after we opened up but yet people weren't coming out as much. So what we did was we helped businesses like that uh, connect them with maybe local leaders or local communities that are looking for spaces to host events. And that's how we were able to help them drum up business. Now, lastly, you know, what do you hope to see for the future of small businesses, of course, across New York City, uh, but especially for the Bronx? Because I know that here in the Bronx, we just have so many, we have a lot of challenges, um, and I think it kind of shows how resilient we are, um, how, like, we, we rise above almost every single time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are some of your, your future hopes for the, the state of, or just the world of small businesses in the Bronx and New York City? Uh, I hope that I see s new and s new and upcoming entrepreneurs every year. Seeing the fire in someone's belly within the first five years of business is one of the things that incites me the most and also gives me hope for the future. Because I know once you've made it within your first five years, you're probably gonna establish a lifestyle that's gonna be paying you for many years to come. So that's what I really like. Always see new innovations, new ideas, and new young entrepreneurs make it out into their industries. Well, I wanna thank you so much for joining us and having this, you know, really important conversation. Um, as we mentioned, you know, the pandemic did, you know, a number on so many businesses, especially in boroughs like the Bronx. So I think it's amazing that your organization is, you know, out here on the ground doing the work to support these, you know, businesses. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. We have to take a quick break, but we'll be back right after this. <music> We all know what it's like to feel alone. But it just takes one new connection. Want to get out of here? To empower many. This is unbelievable. It doesn't take a superhero to bring forces together. We all have the power to reach out. Let's go! And help someone feel like they belong. Pretty cool, huh? We are stronger together. Welcome back. 
New York City schools are recognizing the importance of social emotional learning, commonly referred to as SEL. This approach is known to foster healthy behaviors and cultivate safer school environments with a track record of positive outcomes for students, educators, and the community as a whole. CEO of the Urban Assembly, David Adams, joins me to explore how this approach could have more of a significant impact on young men in our communities. David, thank you so much for joining us. Kim, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Now, I had the pleasure of learning a little bit more about the Urban Assembly a few weeks ago. Um, but for those who are unaware, can you actually just tell us what the Urban Assembly is and some of the work that you do? Absolutely. So the Urban Assembly is a school solutions organization. Um, we're a nonprofit that designs schools. So we have 22 schools uh, that hold the Urban Assembly name here in New York City. Um, we also design and scale solutions uh, that support schools across the country. Um, so we have three areas that we support, social and emotional development, post-secondary readiness and access, and high quality academics. And uh, our goal is to advance the economic and social mobility of young people by improving public education. Now, as CEO, can you just kind of talk a little bit about how this journey began for you? And I'm going to bring it up later on in the interview about like the importance of like just the position that you hold. But can you talk about how that journey started for you? Absolutely. So I've been CEO, CEO of the Urban Assembly for about two and a half years. Um, my predecessor was Kristen Kearns Jordan and her predecessor was Richard Kahn. Um, and very proud to serve as their CEO of the Urban Assembly. Uh, prior to this position, I was the senior director of strategy uh, for about a year. Um, and prior to that position, I was the director of social and emotional learning. Um, as I've moved in my leadership of the Urban Assembly, we've focused our work on de developing generalizable and scalable tools and solutions to improve educational outcomes for students across the country. Now, you also sit on the board of directors of Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Can you talk about that specific experience? Um, and I understand that it's kind of mainly focused on SEL. Uh, so you call, can you talk a little bit more about that? I sure can. Uh, the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, otherwise known as CASEL, uh, is based in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and they are the organization that actually developed the concept of social and emotional learning. Um, the, the work that CASEL has done has really three distinct prongs. Uh, one is practice, one is policy, and one is research. Uh, so when you think about the work of social and emotional learning, you tend to think about the research that demonstrates its effectiveness in populations across the country. And uh, that's one of the things that CASEL has done is create outstanding research to really ground our field um, in ensuring that we know what works and why. Now, let's go to the practice side of what CASEL does. Uh, CASEL has launched uh, two main practice prongs, and one is called the Collaborating States Initiative. I um, mean, and that, the work that they did um, is that we actually helped states develop guidelines and uh, social and emotional learning standards um, so that cities, uh, jurisdictions, local jurisdictions could use those standards to promote social and emotional learning in their schools. And we did that across, I think, about 34 states, which is an amazing achievement. Uh, and then lastly, we talk about practice, um, and that's, uh, excuse me, policy. Uh, and that work has happened to ensure that, uh, for example, um, in the federal stimulus funds, social and emotional learning is written into those funds to ensure that schools can use those funds to support the social emotional outcomes of their students and uh, students in the future. Now, how do both of these organizations, and you can choose one to focus on um, if you like, but how do these organizations prioritize emotional intelligence in, stu in students, but especially in young men? Um, and I understand like for today, like we want to really focus on uh, the importance of that uh, for a lot of young men in our community. So can you expand on that? Sure. So Kim, when we think about social and emotional learning, um, we really think about two kinds of, of competencies. Um, interpersonal competencies. So these are competencies that support our ability to interact with other people, things like relationship skills, things like social awareness, the ability to identify social cues, uh, the ability to understand and take perspective of other people. And those are your interpersonal skills. Uh, then you have your intrapersonal skills. And those are uh, skills that are focused on understanding um, and having awareness of ourselves. Those are skills like emotional identification, um, self-regulation, and those skills really map on very closely to what we think about as emotional intelligence, right? Um, in the emotional intelligence space, uh, and I co-wrote a book, uh, The Educator's Practical Guide to Emotional Intelligence. We talk about the ability to map, move, and match 
emotional information to the situation um, that we are in and the outcome that we're trying to achieve. Now, let's lie or, or place that onto the question of what does this mean for young men? Um, we know, for example, um, that the, the data around young men uh, demonstrates that, uh, for example, about 80% of students classified as emotionally handicapped, emotionally disturbed in special education are uh, boys. Um, when we look at outcomes like uh, prison or, or being involved in the criminal justice system, about 90% of those folks are boys. Um, and so when we think about the work we do for social and emotional learning, what we want to do is we want to promote and equip all of our students to be successful in problem solving with themselves and others. And when we apply that to our young men in specific, we know that the better we do at promoting the social and emotional competencies of our young men, the stronger our communities will be, the stronger relationships will be, and the stronger uh, our young men will be in terms of being able to solve problems in the community and, and other places. And there's also an effort to start with school age children. So why is it so important to start with elementary and even middle school students? And do you do any work with high school students? Great question. Uh, so in fact, most of our work uh, here at the Urban Assembly is with high school students. We do have 22 schools, um, and these Urban Assembly schools are in three boroughs, in Manhattan, in Bronx, and in Brooklyn. And uh, the work of social and emotional learning in Urban Assembly uh, has inspired folks from across the country, uh, in fact, across the world, to invest in the social and emotional development of their kids. And so when we talk about early, middle, and high school students, we talk about a developmental trajectory, a developmental trajectory that integrates uh, these skills across time. And so in elementary school, you might be thinking about uh, making sure that students have the ability to identify their emotions um, and do simple social tasks, like share effectively, uh, communicate their feelings. In middle school, we're gonna start to think about how goal setting and um, more complex emotional tasks, like being able to label effectively one's emotion and how it changes over time in response to a situation. Uh, by high school, you're really thinking about complex problems. Uh, we're mapping emotional and social skills to things like employability, uh, to things like civic readiness. Uh, we're ensuring that high school students have the ability to resolve conflicts effectively uh, using constructive approaches to that. Um, we're making sure that we can set and achieve goals, that we can manage our emotions effectively, and we can identify social cues in ourselves and others. So um, as the developmental trajectory increases in terms of age, uh, the complexity of the skills that we teach increase, um, and the application of these skills is less about, can I do this in the classroom, um, and more about, can I do this in my life? Can I do this in the community? Can I do this on the job? Um, and that's how we think about that spectrum between elementary, middle, and high school for our social emotional learning work. Now, how could looking at race, gender, and even economic status help in assisting young black and brown uh, boys and girls uh, with SEL? That's another great question. Um, so the great news is that a more a recent meta-analysis, and the meta-analysis is a collection of multiple studies. And what happens in the meta-analysis is you look at all the research and, and you try to see what is the general trend of what we know about a field. And the most recent meta-analysis that was conducted on social and emotional learning was done by Dr. Christina Cipriano at Yale University. She led that work. Um, and one of the key outcomes of that is that social and emotional skills work, and social and emotional learning works uh, for students regardless of race, uh, regardless of gender, regardless of rural versus urban versus suburban, um, even regardless of country. So these skills are fun foundational and fundamental skills across the spectrum and across demographics. Now, the one thing that is helpful to understand here um, is that students with a higher risk profile tend to actually make greater gains with universal social and emotional learning programs. So that means that if you have a higher risk factor, you come from a high risk background, um, and you are exposed to high quality social and emotional learning alongside everyone else, those students actually make higher gains quicker than students with lower risk profile. So I'm here to say that the work of SCL is for everyone. And as we apply these skills, students benefit in different ways. And uh, the, the students with the highest risk do the best, have the most gains. And that means that when we do the work, we need to do it for everybody all the time. Now, I'm curious to know, 
Are there any challenges, especially when you are working with students, maybe from high risk backgrounds where uh, being emotional or um, showing any type of feeling could be considered a negative thing, especially when we're talking about young boys who may have challenges with expressing how they feel um, and may use other outlets uh, to kind of express how they feel. Are there any challenges when you're trying to teach them SEL? Well, I got two young sons, um, Elijah and Isaiah, um, and I, I got to let you know that I practice what I preach. Um, my job as a father is to raise sons who know how to constructively solve problems, how to communicate effectively, and to be part of a community or group. Uh, so when we think about what does it take to do that, um, we need to understand that these are skills that allow everybody to be more successful. Uh, when I teach my sons how to communicate their needs and feelings effectively, uh, it means that I can respond to them in more constructive ways. The difference between throwing a controller on the ground and taking a breath is the difference between a young person who knows how to manage their emotions and a young person who's on a path of higher risk. So while it is sometimes challenging uh, to teach young men particular the power of communication and the power of being able to be clear and expressive with how you're feeling and how that is impacting what you're trying to accomplish, we know that when we do that well, these young men are on a better path and a better trajectory to success. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought up kind of like a personal experience um, for that question because my next question was basically going to be talking about visibility um, and how has your visibility as a successful black man impact the work that you do with other young black boys and young men? That's a great question. Um, there are times when I give speeches and uh, a young black man or even a middle-aged black man will come up to me um, and said, uh, the fact that you were here, the fact that you were speaking the way that you're speaking about, the things that you were speaking about um, has inspired me to go back and do work for myself and to, to uplift others. Um, and so for me, I feel a responsibility to live up to the expectations and to live up um, to the folks who delivered me and delivered our community. Um, and that means that I seek to pursue excellence for myself, I seek to pursue excellence for my organization, and I seek to pursue excellence in our schools. Um, and I think when we all understand that we are a product of the sacrifices of those who delivered us, uh, we take that responsibility and we turn it into impact, and that's what I hope to do with my life. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now, how do you ensure children all children, because we, we mentioned that, you know, SEL is for everyone. How do you ensure that all children feel seen and represented in this type of work? Um, and I bring this up because I think just in general, you know, we, we talk about boys, but I think being emotional in society is sometimes seen as like a bad thing, um, even mm -hmm. for like young girls when people will say, oh, you're too emotional, you know, uh, it's always kind of a negative con connotation. So how do you just ensure that like all of these children feel seen, represented and validated in this type of work? Well, let's take a step back, right? Um, the first thing I think we all need to understand is that emotions are information. Uh, they give us information about ourselves. They give us information about the environment around them. Uh, what we do with our emotions uh, matters. And so I assume when people say uh, you're emotional or you're too emotional, right? Uh, what I think they probably mean um, is that your behavior um, is reflecting your feelings um, as opposed to your intent. So we can feel many things. Uh, we can feel happy, sad, disappointed, angry. We can feel um, elated. We can think about all the ways that we feel. Uh, how we manage those emotions what we do with those feelings, how they drive our interactions, that's what we talk about when we talk about social emotional learning and to a certain extent, emotional intelligence. Now, when we're talking to young people, one of the things that's really important is that everybody feels emotion. There's this idea that, uh, especially for young people, that they're the only ones feeling the big emotions, um, everything from disappointment uh, to elation, that, that they are the only ones who ever felt this. Um, but in fact, we've all felt emotions. And as we mature in adults, we learn to express these emotions in ways that are constructive. So at the end of the day, the outcome of high quality SEL is constructive problem solving around inter and intrapersonal skill sets. 
Now, SEL also leads to improved academic achievement, which I think is amazing because at the end of the day, that's like uh, one of the biggest goals when you have students in school, you want them to achieve great things academically. Can you just expand on how this could be a game changer for so many black and brown communities? I sure can. Uh, one of the key outcomes, again, of um, Dr. Christina Cipriano's study uh, is that social and emotional learning is a key contributor to academic success. Um, in fact, some research has demonstrated that social and emotional skill development is as important in terms of this it contribute to academic success as interventions like tutoring um, and interventions that are based in uh, teaching and learning and curriculum. Now, uh, when we do this work, one of the things that we identified is the pathway between social emotional skills and academic success tends to be through things like self-management, goal setting, personal responsibility, and decision-making skills. That means that if we focus on teaching young people how to set and achieve goals and how to manage their emotions, how to take in information to make good decisions, they will do better on their academic outcomes. And that's amazing to me, right? Because I think sometimes we think that academic outcomes are almost always content-based, you know, uh, how much knowledge do you know? How fast can you process information if we're thinking about IQ and something like that? But in fact, there are these other skills that really are predictive of, of uh, academic outcomes. And in fact, uh, there was a research study about 1993 by uh, Dr. Kenther and uh, Wenzel, and she identified that you could predict graduation rates um, in 12th grade by looking at students' self-management skills and social-emotional skills in third grade. So the takeaway here is that there are some foundational things that every child can learn. And it doesn't matter about your IQ, and it doesn't matter about how fast you read. Uh, you can learn how to set and achieve goals. You can learn how to manage your emotions. You can learn how to make good decisions. And if you learn those things, your academic outcomes will improve. Now we have about a minute left, and I really want to know, you know, how is SEL evolving to match the interests and goals of kids today? I hear so many people say, you know, our kids are constantly changing. You know, are there any plans to evolve or, you know, what we have now, is this kind of like where we want to stay? Well, we're always changing in the field of social and emotional learning. Um, some exciting things that are happening is there's no, now a social and emotional uh, learning journal of policy, uh, practice, um, and research. There is a new handbook of social and emotional learning coming out, and I'm happy to preview some of the cool things that are happening. Um, one is that uh, the field is really looking at the role of technology in social and emotional learning um, and how to engage students uh, digitally in different spaces to teach social emotional skills. Um, and then the other thing we're always looking at is how to integrate social emotional skills more explicitly in academic spaces um, as well as after school and post-secondary spaces so that young people can get SEL everywhere all the time because we know that it works. All right, David, I want to thank you so much for joining us and having this conversation. And I really enjoyed it because, as I mentioned, like uh, students are always learning. And I don't think this was something that I was taught about in high school um, or middle school or elementary school. And I'm so glad that it's being kind of like taught to children now. So, you know, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this. Thanks so much for having me. We have to take a quick break. We'll be right we'll be right back after this. the hard part. You quit smoking. Now do the easy part and get scanned for lung cancer. If you smoked, you may still be at risk, but early detection could save your life. Talk to your doctor and learn more at savedbythescan.org. Welcome back. 
Chaya is a nonprofit organization dedicated to addressing housing and economic needs among low income South Asian and Indo Caribbean residents in New York. Their mission involves delivering essential services to the community and empowering individuals to shape their own futures and build resilience in the face of challenges. Here now joining us is Executive Director of Chaya Community Development Corporation, Aneta Sicheron. Aneta, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, can you provide an overview of Chaya's mission and the specific housing and economic needs it aims to address for low-income South Asian and Indo-Caribbean New Yorkers? Chaya is a community development corporation uh, dedicated to serving low-income South Asians and Indo-Caribbean New Yorkers. Let me tell you who this community is. We are often misunderstood um, I think the model minority myth uh, sort of casts us as a, a group of folks who don't really need any uh, support. Um, however, uh, South Asians uh, suffer from among the highest rates of overcrowdedness. About 30% of populations that we serve are, are w below the poverty line. Uh, this community often um, is daunted by, um, uh, by the barriers facing them around uh, housing rights. They often don't understand their housing rights. They often uh, face language barriers. And, and so, and has for a very long time been forgotten or ignored when it comes to housing needs. And so Chaya has been, um, for the last two decades, working to address these uh, critical housing needs facing low-income South Asians and Indo-Caribbeans. Now, Chaya's approach involves providing direct services while empowering individuals to shape their own futures. Can you explain how this strategy works in practice and some of the critical services you offer? Absolutely. So we are a small nonprofit. And in fact, I should say that we're the only South Asian driven community development corporation in New York City and in the nation. And our community is large. The needs are complex. So there's only so much that a small nonprofit can do in terms of meeting the critical needs that the community faces today. We recognize that. And with that, we, we, we believe that addressing issues that affect every New Yorker uh, systemic issues around housing, around exclusion, around economic well-being, um, that we have, we have a perspective and we have a role to play in changing the systems that not only just affects the, the folks that we are unable to serve because we're a small organization, but every New Yorker who needs our services. So I'll give you an example. Uh, at the height of the pandemic, Chaya played a leading role in advocating for the Home Ownership Assistance Fund or rental assistance for New Yorkers. And that, that, you know, that effort goes beyond the limited number of folks that we, we serve. And so, hence, we have always believed that we must use the insight, the information that we are, that we have as a result of our direct service work to inform system-wide change. Now, over the past 20 years, Chaya has been actively involved in advocating for systemic changes, including basement legalizations and tenant rights. Now, I'm really curious, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the basement legalization um, and, you know, why that was important, especially for your community? Many New Yorkers rely on a basement income to be able to afford their homes. And this is in every borough, in every community. Basements have served as safe, affordable homes for thousands and thousands of New Yorkers since the very beginning. Um, and uh, yet, many basement units are considered unauthorized. And what we have seen um, for a very long time now, for decades now, is that homeowners can face unexpected fines that can range anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000. And those fines can destabilize the homeowner or threaten their ability to be able to keep their home and of course also displace a tenant and very often these th these relationships are informal they often work but sometimes they're not they, sometimes they don't work and so the the 
the goal with the basement legalization campaign is to create a citywide program that would support homeowners in bringing their units up to code so that they can rent them legally. And it would also support tenants to ensure that they are uh, that these units are safe because some of them are not safe. Many are, and some are not. Um, and then we also saw with the with the recent uh, with with Hurricane Ida, the fact that 11 people died in basement units was truly, I think, an you know uh, a, a moment that I think showed very clearly the critical importance of addressing the basement issue. Basement units serve as an important part of the affordable housing market, and yet we do not have a formal formal program that supports these units to be to come into come out of the shadows and and to be formalized so that tenants can be safe and supported and homeowners can be safe and supported. Thank you so much for clarifying that. And, you know, that's just like one of the many things your organization has done, you know, over the past two decades. Can you talk about some of the policy issues that Chai is currently advocating for and what impact have your efforts had on immigrant communities in New York? Yeah. Um, so there are many issues that, that Chaya continues to work on, whether it is for long-term support for homeowners or um, greater tenant protections. Um, but uh, in, in recent years, we have been really leaning into the commercial rent uh, issue. Small businesses are the backbone of New York City. They, are, they create neighborhoods that we love, that make New York City so unique, so special. They also provide um, uh, an important um, income for people who work there and for the small business owners. Yet they are they suffer from a lack of protections. We've seen over recent years with gentrification and um, just just a tight you know market in general that uh, commercial rents um, have been skyrocketing and they just continue to to rise and especially in 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 certain neighborhoods. Yet there are no supports and protections for commercial tenants. So they are truly at the whim of the landlord. Many, um, many are, are sometimes just thrown out without any notice. Um, and so the idea is to create better supports, better protections for small businesses. And we feel like, you know, as we think about the future of New York City, um, ensuring the stability of small businesses is going to be critical. And then can you talk about how that's, you know, important for communities of color, especially immigrant communities, uh, you know, across New York City? M many immigrant communities uh, rely on a small business, not just for their income, but of their, for their sense of connectedness, for, for services, um, whether it's like, you know, foods that that um, that they you know that is affirming to them culturally that they need, whether it's just other other cultural services, right? Um, they are absolutely critical. And actually, the our small business districts really make New York City special. It's the thing that differentiates us from you know the you know average city in in the United States is the th thriving small business sector and. So this is absolutely critical for the stability of communities and the stability of jobs and and for the um, for for the creation of a sense of belonging and community and connection for immigrant populations and communities of color in general, not just uh, immigrant populations, but all communities of color. Now, civic participation is a crucial aspect of Chaya's work. How does the organization encourage South Asian and Indo-Caribbean voices to be heard at the local and national levels? And what initiatives have you undertaken to promote civic engagement? So, you know, this is this is um, uh, going back to this issue of how what else does Chaya do beyond meeting the critical needs of our communities today? Again, we are a small organization. And we do. We believe that change can really occur only if if community members are um, are voting, are involved, and are making their needs and and voices heard. Um, otherwise, we social services is really functioning at the margins and just putting you know taking a band aid approach. 
But we are we are really interested in long term deep change, and so really the only way to uh, effectively do that is to uh, support community members to to become more civically engaged, to join community boards, to vote, because electeds care about this. And the, the, the communities, I mean, we've seen across, in not just here in the city, but across this country, the loudest, the squeaky wheel gets, gets the grease, right? The voices, the, the voices that are the loudest get the, the resources and the, and the supports and the opportunities. And so Chaya does this in many ways. We um, typically for uh, elections in, in key elections in districts where there are large numbers of the communities that we serve, we do voter education, voter, um, and just basically GOTV work. Um, uh, in the past, we've done um, we've done uh, citizenship work, uh, but primarily now these days we are really focused on educating community members about the importance of voting. Now, I, I also want to add earlier um, in the segment, you you mentioned the model um, minority myth. You know, do you think being more engaged in this way in the community can help uh, kind of put an end to that myth? Because now uh, people are, you know, able to like hear the voices and kind of understand the experiences of, you know, people from this community. Uh, so, you know, do you in any way think that like being more civically just engaged um, and things like this can help uh, fight against the model minority myth? Absolutely. And I, I think it takes many things, but it also, for sure, the voices of the people as the most powerful voices. And I think if we don't tell our stories, if we don't make our needs heard, our, we, will, we will never get the supports and the resources that we need. Now, Chaya organizes direct action and community mobilization, engaging community members with local government processes. Can you share some examples of successful community action or campaigns that have made a difference in the neighborhoods you serve? There are so many. Uh, historically, Chaya has organized to get South Asian languages on the ballot. Um, I spoke earlier about the Homeownership Assistance Fund. These are some examples of the kinds of things that Chaya has been involved with. I, I will say that, you know, again, we are a small organization. We do none of this work alone. We work very much in coalition with our partner organizations in, you know, across the city in different spaces, whether it's the economic justice space, the housing space, or the immigrant rights space. And, you know, I think that's actually really interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of collaborating with other local, you know, organizations? Uh, because, I, you know, sometimes we, I think it's important to have organizations that focus on specific communities. Uh, but I think, like, you mentioning how, you know, you've, you've worked uh, with other organizations and that you don't do it alone is also really important and, and worth uh, noting. So can you expand on that a little bit more? It's impossible to really affect deep, and long-lasting change if you work in isolation. It takes all of us. And again, the policy issues that we work on is not just for any singular community. It's for all New Yorkers. And, and we need each other. You know, we, we may bring, for example, we've been leading the basement legalization campaign, but we recognize that this isn't an issue that just faces South Asians, right, and Indo-Caribbeans that this is a citywide issue. And, you know, to be able to effectively run that campaign, we are not, we don't have the capacity or the expertise to do the data, um, the data analysis that's needed. And so we worked with our partner organization, Pratt, for example, who, who really lean in on the data piece or other, or other groups like CHPC who help with some of the sort of design concepts and some of the bigger policy stuff. So. Um, you know, these are some examples of how we collaborate. But, uh, you know, in the years that I've been doing this work, I, I've seen again and again that the most powerful, effective, um, and, and fastest change occurs only through broad-based collaborations. And, you know, we, we as, you know, like relatively new Americans, um, we recognize that we, sh we stand on the shoulders of black Americans, of Latinos, of people who've been doing this work for, you know, decades before us. And we, we see ourselves in, in alliance with those communities um, <clears throat> and, and, and work very closely in, in collaboration with, with really, with those communities and all marginalized communities. 
Now, another thing that's uh, kind of important that you mentioned uh, is that, like, you know, many of these communities have similar goals um, and similar uh, things that they want to achieve and also face similar challenges. And I think that, you know, one of those challenges is becoming a homeowner. Now, I understand your organization actually offers a first time home buyer uh, program and a foreclosure prevention program. Can you just talk a little bit about, you know, the services that you offer to help assist people, uh, you know, in this realm? So our, um, our first time home buyer program is one of our signature programs. There's the demand is, has, is always high. Um, and really what we do, you know, buying a home in, in this country, in this city is a daunting uh, process for anybody, whether, um, you know, even if you're not uh, limited English proficient or you are comfortable financially. And so when you you know look at like uh, low income folks, low to moderate income folks in the city, it, it's very challenging and it continues to to be even harder um, given uh, the tight the tight housing market and the skyrocketing prices of homes. And so our program takes um, prospective home buyers through a process where we we um, we help them understand like what's involved. Um, what is, you know, what's involved financially? What does it involve? How to plan ahead to ensure that you're able to, to keep this home that you've worked so hard for? How to, like, um, you know, prevent foreclosure ultimately? Ultimately, the goal is to ensure more black and brown homeownership in New York City, which has been steadily declining in uh, recent years. Now, can you discuss Chaya's future goals and initiatives in addressing, you know, the housing and economic needs and, you know, just all of the, the many challenges um, of the South Asian and Indo-Caribbean communities in New York? There are so many. Um, you know, we, we, we believe the work that we do of uh, ensuring the housing stability and the economic well-being of our community is the right goal. Um, it's what's needed right now. Um, we will continue to lean into that. I think we will. Uh, we believe the direct service work that we do, whether it's the homeownership um, education work, the tenant work, the small business work, the immigration legal services, and um, financial education, free tax prep, um, and all the policy work. All of that is absolutely critical. Our goal is to continue to grow those services, to take them to neighborhoods that are underserved. For so long, as I mentioned earlier um, in this conversation, our communities have been invisible to social services and to policymakers. And so our goal is to continue to draw attention to the needs of our communities. And we truly believe that, you know, um, in this notion that all boats rise, that, you know, if, if by leaning into the needs of our communities, we there is a rippling effect across um, across our neighbors and neighborhoods and the, and the city. Now, could you quickly just let us know how can individuals and organizations support your mission and contribute to the betterment of the communities you serve? There are many ways. There are many ways. Learn more about Chaya. Um, go to our website at uh, uh, www.chayacdc.org. Reach out to us. We are always looking for volunteers. We are looking for um, dozens of volunteers to uh, to be a part of our free tax prep program. You don't have to be an accountant. Um, you just have to be interested, um, uh, and we will train you. Uh, we need volunteers. We are always hiring people. If you are interested in making a difference in in the community, in this work, and to have a great, fulfilling career, check us out. Um, we, we are, of course, we rely on financial support to be able to do our work. We are a nonprofit organization that, um, that is funded by multiple sources, individuals, foundations, and government sources. Um, and so um, support us. And those are the ways in which you can. All right. I want to thank you so much for joining us and, you know, talking with me and really sharing your experience, uh, for, you know, that so many people in your community uh, have. And then I know as a, you know, person of color, we share very similar experiences. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.
We've come to the end of our show today. We hope you enjoyed this week's discussion on the Bronx Social Justice and Anti-Violence Forums. To re-watch this week's edition, you can catch the Recable cast right here on bronxnet.org. If you want to join the conversation and present your point of view, you can visit our social media at bronxnet TV. Join us next week as we continue to elevate the discussion and bring further awareness across the globe. I'm your host, Kim Naline. Take care. <laughs>